Emily, what's on your radar? Well, back on June 17th, Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul Pelosi, bought somewhere between $1 million and $5 million worth of computer chip stock. Now, here's a headline from the New York Times that very same day. Here, you can see the disclosure Pelosi herself signed on July 14th, which Unusual Whales brought to my attention actually right after we finished taping last week's show. Now, here's Pelosi's response to a Fox News's reporter, Fox News reporter's question about whether her husband, Paul Pelosi, ever traded on information based on information she shared with him about Congress. Uh, over the course of your career, uh, has your husband ever made a stock purchase or sale based on information he's received from you? What are you saying? Uh, over the course of your career, has your husband ever made a stock purchase or sale based on information he's received from you? No, absolutely not. Okay. Now, congressional negotiations over the CHIPS Act are very public. Everyone knows about them. NVIDIA is trading well, and analysts say the company wouldn't, quote, directly benefit from the legislation. That doesn't mean indirect benefits are out of the question or that Pelosi didn't know about something germane to the sale being discussed behind closed doors. It also doesn't mean her husband's stocks are totally out of mind when she's legislating. We basically have to take her word for it. The speaker does not own any stocks, this is what her spokesman said, as you can see from the required disclosures with which the speaker fully cooperates, these transa transactions are marked SP for spouse. The speaker has no prior knowledge or subsequent involvement in any transactions. That's what he told Fox News, the spokesman for Pelosi. So we have her word, but then we also have her track record, which doesn't exactly work in Pelosi's favor. Peter Schweitzer wrote extensively about Pelosi in his eye-opening 2011 book, quote, throw them all out, that was the title of the book, great title, which peeled back the curtain on both Republicans and Democrats. Back in 2011, CBS reported on the Pelosi's participation in at least eight IPOs. One of those came in 2008 from Visa, just as a troublesome piece of legislation that would have hurt credit card companies began making its way through the House, undisturbed by a potential conflict of interest, the Pelosi's purchased 5,000 shares of Visa at the initial price of $44, as CBS reported at the time. Two days later, it was trading at $64. The credit card legislation never made it to the floor of the House. In his book, Schweitzer also reported that Pelosi, quote, seems to have a history of advancing earmarks that are near her family's commercial real estate. And that's one of Congress's favorite ways to quietly enrich itself, although the media doesn't cover it very often. Schweitzer also reported on her questionable investments in national ga natural gas over the years. Nonetheless, Democrats handed Pelosi, the self-appointed master legislator with her well-known fundraising prowess, the speaker's gavel back years later. Why wouldn't she be run out of town by these scandals? Surely this level of corruption is a political liability, right? Well, in order to be run out of town, people have to know enough to run. Fox News analyzed the transcripts of CNN, MSNBC, CBS, NBC, and ABC from the day the story broke through the following Monday. None of those networks mentioned Paul Pelosi's trade. Many of the outlets that did cover the trade declined to contextualize the information with the couple's history of questionable financial decisions, probably because nobody knows about it, because few outlets have covered this over the years. It's kind of a vicious cycle that allows Pelosi to be treated like a girl boss from the self-described defenders of democracy in our fourth estate. Of course, when I checked whether the same outlets Fox look at, looked at covered the news that former Senator Kelly Leffler, this was back in March of 2020, made some questionable trades after an early COVID briefing, a probe that ensnared other senators the DOJ has since dropped, most of those outlets had covered it and had covered it relatively quickly. Now this isn't exactly apples to apples because I didn't have access to their on-air transcripts, but I did find digital coverage of the trades from the outlets. And aside from, looking, from some local affiliates running a Sinclair wire service report, there wasn't much there. Oddly enough, I thought about this when Sarah Matthews said during the January 6th hearing last night that White House officials resisted sending messages to rioters during the chaos so as to avoid giving the media a win. Think about that. These hearings have chosen theater over substance, but that's actually a pretty useful little revelation because it's truly how Trump and his allies on the right see things. Vindicating the media is to be avoided at all costs because it legitimizes an institution that deserves little overall legitimacy. That's the logic. Now, I disagree, of course, but the years of unfair, disparate treatment are taking a toll. And while Trump is to blame for his individual failings, some of the blame is also on the media, which lies about being neutral and that then acts 
acts as anything but. And while we're talking about conflicts of interest, let's remember that while Congress is considering major tech and China legislation, the Senate Majority Leader's daughters work at Meta and Amazon, and the Senate Minority Leader is married into a family that does extensive business with the Chinese government, such as the state of Washington, D.C. Ryan Drew Hamill, is, that's Pelosi spokesman, a uh, longtime spokesman, in his statement when he said that Pelosi is, he, she cooperates fully with the transparency requirements. To me, that's really the point. She does, she does. Like you can just mark this down and whether, whether you think this individual trade was questionable, I mean, I think it's clearly a conflict of interest that even if it didn't have anything to do with insider trading or knowledge, it's a conflict of interest that you shouldn't be able to do. So even if you think this individual trade is sort of a one-off and a bad example, whatever. The point is, she's able to be fully transparent about this like naked conflict of interest and naked level of corruption, and nobody cares. It makes a couple headlines once in a while, and then we all just go on, move about our business. We go on, move on, go about our business. Yeah. The same thing is true of Chuck Schumer. The same thing is true of Mitch McConnell. We just keep pressing on, and these bills keep coming up and getting watered down, basically. Yeah, and it goes to our complete collapse of kind of civic virtue, I think, in our yes. in our government, because this kind of thing should be so thoroughly stigmatized that it doesn't even need to be made illegal. The fact that it's not uh, means that it does uh, need to be made illegal. But if you walk it backwards and say, OK, you know what? Pelosi says she never trades a stock. Let's take her at her word. Fine. She does. She never trades a stock. Her husband trades the stocks. Now, what what do they what do they talk about? But when uh, when they're talking about their day, like, are they, does she ever mention what's going to happen with the chips bill? Like, so is she in some, in the in a situation where she's just you know voluntarily kind of gagging herself and can't talk about anything that happens at work because she's the speaker of the house. Everything that she touches is going to have some effect on some element of the market, and because uh, Paul Pelosi is invested all over the place you know everything she touches is going to affect his investments one way or another so you can you could just go through uh and you know probably hit every single trade and find some connection between something and so the answer to that is just don't do this like yes. you have to have a kind of s s sense of civic virtue that says that if you're going to serve the public that's what that's what you're going to do that's what your and that's what your that's what your family is going to do. that's what your husband uh, is is going to do it's it's just it's we're not at a place where you can just ask the public to just trust you that you know you're not you're not walking away with any ex additional proceeds here uh, and it, it is in open secret and Katie Porter said as much just the other day she's like we know that there are people who are doing insider trading here uh, we, we know that and it's connected actually uh, to the fact that there hasn't been a, a raise for yeah. members of Congress for a very long time. And the implicit, and I, and I suspect, and I've been told, you know, ex explicit, though not putting down in paper, deal is, look, okay, yes, we understand that $174,000 is a lot to have two homes on, you know, two homes in two major cities. Uh, that's asking a lot of these people who are, you know, accustomed to making tons more. You know, if you talk to somebody who's making the median salary, in the in the U.S. and say, okay, you're going to make 174,000 now, and yes, you'll have to have an extra apartment. They'll be like, well, I can I can totally make that work. We're not talking about those. We were talking about these elites, these elites. And the the deal is they're 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 not going to get a raise, but they're going to be able to make this little uh, this little extra 10 percent for the big guys, as as in a, as they say in a different context. Uh, so that's going to kind of supplement their income, and that's where you get all the resistance from because people are like people are saying like, wait a minute. I, I agreed to not take a pay raise because I'm getting this. You t now you're going to take this away too, and it's and it it it's just a complete collapse of of civic virtue. Yeah, and that 10% little bump is not innocuous. It actually it gets things taken in, taken out of legislation or put into legislation that shouldn't be there. Um, and so like while they're enriching themselves just for that little extra cash, like AOC was talking last week about how it's hard to have two homes in two different major cities and she caught some flack for that. But I remember when Sean Duffy, who has a bunch of kids, um, was elected to Congress in Wisconsin, was making sort of a similar argument. It's actually kind of legitimately true. Like that's, that is, if, you, if you're trying to rent in DC yeah. and in New York City, that's really difficult. Um, and if you're trying to raise seven, eight kids, that's also really 
really difficult. So yeah, but I mean, still, the, the civic virtue point plays into that in and of itself, that you should be serving the public not to make money. You should be serving the public because um, you, know, you, you genuinely want to do a public service. And we used to have an ecosystem that incentivized it. So you, the public used to have you know, what felt like more of a voice. Um, the media used to do a better job of using sunlight as the best disinfectant. But I mean, even like if you look at Mitch McConnell, I think they're way harsher on Republicans on this stuff than they are because it fits this sort of broader liberal narrative about uh, you know corporatist Republican fat cats. So it's shifting a little bit. It's it's never mentioned in the media. It's so rarely mentioned in the media. His enormous conflicts of interest through his the family that he married into, um, his his father-in-law, his sister-in-law have massive investments um, in in China. They right. sit on the board, I believe, of a major Chinese uh, shipping company. I mean, it's just like incredible, and it's a, it's a giant shrug for us because we're so mm. far afield from a different time when this would be stigmatized, when the media wouldn't let you get away with it, when voters wouldn't let you get away with it because the media wasn't letting you, letting you get away with it. It's unbelievable. Although let's not go too overboard in, in uh, valorizing the past too, because if you think about it was the first Congress that took up <laughs> Hamilton's assumption of the federal debt, a bunch of those members of Congress went out ahead of time and got this debt at pennies. And then when the federal government as assumed the debt in the deal that basically you know moved Congress down to, down to Washington, D.C., uh, they made a they made a huge upside uh, by buying buying the, the the revolutionary war debt at pennies and then getting the federal government to buy it back from them um, in in dollars. So ever since the first Congress, that's you know there's been a side hustle in, yeah. in kind of specul speculating on legislation that you then get to vote on. No, it's not new. I just think the lack of stigma, at least yes. in mo in recent history, yeah. is, is definitely something. I think that I think, that, I think that's real. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. great. <laughs> Just, that's where we are, such as, such as the state of uh, Washington, D.C. in 2022. We will be back with more Rising right after this.